All right, so uh, chapter seven is on interpersonal relationships. And um, something, again, we all know about. Why? Because, well, we have interpersonal relationships all the time. It's not something, I'm not telling you some great, huge discovery. This whole area of communications, we should be familiar with it. It's just that what's great about studying something like interpersonal communications in a very scientific way, and we study communication that happens in interpersonal relationships, and we consider all the dynamics, all the aspects of it, all the things that a lot of times we do, but we don't even realize we do, or we don't think about them, or we don't think about them in that way, okay? And that is really what, uh, what we do in this class. It's a way for us to look at communication that happens in the area of interpersonal relationships that is very organized, that is very, uh, sort of say, broken up by types of relationships that we have and how those types of relationships affect our communication because we don't have the same type of communication with everyone. We change our communication depending on the type of relationship we have. We've already spoken about this before. Depending how personal the relationship is, depending on how close your relationship is, you communicate with people differently. You don't communicate with strangers or people you barely know the same way as with people with your close friends do, you know, or roommates or, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, things like that, you know, husband and wife. These are all different types of relationships. And depending on the kind of relationship you have, you'll have, you'll vary the mode of your communication. And that's really what we're studying. So there's appropriate communication levels and dynamics for each type a relationship. So uh, in this session, we'll be looking um, at several things. Uh, first of all, uh, in the first part, we will explain the advantages and disadvantages of interpersonal relationships. So there are pluses and minuses to having interpersonal relationships. Look, relationships are hard. Okay. Uh, we will also look at the stages uh, of interpersonal relationships. All relationships move through very predictable stages, and we'll look a little, a little bit about and, and think about those. Uh, we'll also define the types of relationships that we have, things like friendship and family and you know, workplace relationships, um, and we'll also explain um, the theories of attractions and rules of so social exchange and things like that. Uh, those are kind of our main objectives. Uh, there's another one that we'll look at, uh, you know, um, maybe in, in some sideways, but we'll, this is our trajectory. That's where we're going to go. So uh, our objective number one is to explain the advantages and the disadvantages of uh, interpersonal relationships. What do you guys think? Are there disadvantages to interpersonal relationships. Can you, I know that everyone can say advantages are easy, you know. We all have something to gain by having relationships with each other. What I want to hear from you is maybe some things just off the top of your head uh, that you could say, these are the bad things that come out of relationships. These are the disadvantages. You know, yeah, relationships are great because they give me this, 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 and this, and this. But what, what are the bad things that come out of relationships? What do you, can you think of the disadvantages? Because some people choose not to have a lot of relationships. And the reason why they choose not to have a lot of relationships with a lot of people are those disadvantages, by the way. So can you think of any disadvantages for me? Just off the top of your head. Especially in the workplace, sometimes compared with uh, colleagues or Okay. Or other, yeah. Okay, so criticism, if somebody's critical, that obviously causes you some emotional harm. If somebody's being hard on you, they're criticizing you. So I can see that's a disadvantage of having a relationship. I don't want to be friends with you if you're going to be mean to me, right? Uh, and workplace conflict. So people have disagreements at work, problems at work. Yeah, those, those relationships are problematic. But those are relationships you don't necessarily choose to have. You're kind of stuck with your, you know, other people that you work with because it's not like you hired them for the job. You work together as a team, as a group, and you didn't put that team together unless you're the boss. So, 
Uh, but you know, think about some other, what are some other disadvantages that you can have in, in just interpersonal relationships? Even in friendships, in love relationships, what are some of the disadvantages that you can have? What's the downside? Think out loud with me. Any ideas? Any thoughts? There's no right or wrong answer to this question, by the way. I'm looking for your opinion, okay? So that means pretty much any answer you give me is the right answer. What do you think? What are some of the disadvantages? I know there's stuff in your head. I know you're thinking. You're just not letting it out. You gotta let it out. You guys are making it tough on me. All right. So let's look at some advantages, and we'll look at the list of disadvantages. I'm gonna look. It's all. It's all in the textbook, by the way. In case, in case you're wondering. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in this textbook that that explains this too. So. The obvious advantages of interpersonal relationships is that they help you lessen loneliness. Here's a fact. As human beings, we're not meant to be alone. We're not meant for that. Most people do not do well alone. Now, there are some people who are okay alone, but they're rare and unique individuals. Most of us as human beings are social. We're social beings. We like to be around other people. Even if we don't have a deep relationship with other people, we like to be around other people. That's just how we are. It's part of our nature. We like to be around others. And so having a relationship lessens this idea of loneliness. It can be very hard to be on your own by yourself with your own thoughts all the time. It, so that's one of the advantages. Um, you can learn a lot about yourself, um, and uh, you know, as as you develop your relationship uh, with other people, uh, because our relationships are not all the same, because we play different roles as we go through life. Some of them are, you know, child-parent relationships. Well, you learn a lot about yourself being a child. Well, you learn even more about yourself being a parent to a child. Uh, believe it or not, nobody's born being a parent. You learn as you go along, and, and this is a process that you learn more about yourself, about your character, uh, as you have to work with people, as you have to deal with conflicts at the workplace, as you mentioned. We do have conflicts at the workplace. You learn what are you like dealing with conflicts. Are you a problem? Are you a conflict maker? Are you a peacemaker? Are you a troublemaker? You learn these things about yourself. Some people realize, wait a minute, you know, and this is a tough realization for some people. <laughs> they say, wait a minute, everything was fine until I joined the team, and now the whole team doesn't work. Do you think the problem might be me? Mm -hmm. Now, most people have a hard time answering that question because it requires a lot of honesty. But sometimes you learn this about yourself. Wait a minute, I don't work well with others. I am not a team player. I come in and I boss everybody around. I tell everybody what to do. But that's not what I'm supposed to do in a team. So you learn things about yourself as a parent. You learn things about yourself as a child. Uh, you know, if you're a manager, if you have to be a boss, you learn things about yourself. Some people are not good bosses because they can't make tough decisions. Because they cannot take responsibility. They can't shoulder it, okay? And so, if you have a friendship, you learn things about yourself from being a friend. Are you a good friend or you're a bad friend? You know, nobody's born, you know, being a perfect friend. These things you learn. Sometimes you're a bad friend and you learn that. And through growth, perhaps next time you will be a better friend. Things like that. And so <clears throat> having relationships actually allows us to develop ourselves and develop our character. Learn things about ourselves and coincidentally adapt those things about ourselves. If we didn't have those relationships, we would not grow in that area at all. Why? Because we wouldn't have the experimentation that happens. So um, <clears throat> this is something that the authors tell us in the textbook is that the research 
shows that interpersonal relationships contribute significantly to physical and emotional health. We get better emotionally if we are around other people. Uh, and that means physical health as well. So sometimes, you know, other people motivate us, let's put it this way, to be healthier, to be better. Uh, when I'm around my friends who eat very healthy, I eat very healthy. When I'm around friends who eat very unhealthy, I eat very unhealthy. So things like that. We are influenced by our relationships. And a lot of times we're influenced in a positive way. And sometimes we're influenced in a negative way. So that, you know, but most people show that people are healthier in relationships than out of them. That's what the research shows. Having relationships helps us more so. Not having them does not. Um, <clears throat> also, <clears throat> people have noticed that uh, having relationship a lot of times, to a lot of people that means uh, a general function, that means maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. And what they mean by that is that um, there are things that in life that we derive pleasure from. We enjoy things. And enjoying those things in relationship with someone is much more enjoyable than be doing it by yourself. You know, some people might enjoy hiking or mountain climbing. And that's great to do alone. But it's even better to do it in a group with other people because you can share some of that happiness and joy. You know, going to the mountain peak and climbing and conquering this mountain. And there's several of your friends who are working with you to do that. You can share that happiness with joy. And so if you achieved some of the greatest achievements and you're all by yourself, you have nobody to share it with, nobody to celebrate with, nobody to rejoice with, it makes it very depressing. And, and next time, we don't want to make an achievement. Why? Because even if we do or we do not, nobody's going to recognize it. Nobody's there to recognize that we've achieved something. So you see, that's a problem. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, that's in that sense, we're maximizing our pleasure in life in general. And we're minimizing our pain. Sometimes we're, when we're going through suffering, when things are tough for us, when we're sick, when we're struggling with a class, having other people who understand us, maybe who are struggling with us as well, or helping us along, actually makes it better. We can persevere, we can work through it, we can deal with it better when there's other people who are dealing with us simultaneously as we go through life. Doing it on your own, can we do it? Yes, perhaps we can. But doing it with others, we do it better. We do it better. So <clears throat> there are several aspects of life that our relationships change. Having those relationships and doing those things in relationship transforms those tasks in life. Uh, <clears throat> the authors make a point that, and you know, path, uh, the, the way the plants orient themselves to light, human beings orient themselves to the sources of stimuli. Uh, we are stimulated by others. As human beings, a lot of times we do what we do because somebody causes us to do that. They influence us, okay? I mean, I can tell you this about myself. I am very much motivated to do certain things because of other people. Okay, if I know that what I'm doing will benefit someone, I will do it. If I know that nobody will be benefited from what I'm doing, I will not do it. I'm actually motivated by public benefit. I'm motivated by something that I'm doing that's helping somebody else. That's how I feel about it, you know, uh, even teaching a class. If I know that people are listening and paying attention and learning and growing, I'm excited about it. It makes me want to do it more and more. But if I feel like nobody cares, nobody wants to learn, I'm not motivated. I don't want to show up. I don't want to do a good job. You know, and all of a sudden, I'm like that. So we are, human beings like to be stimulated. Stimulation in life creates interest, creates activity, creates drive for us. So being in a relationship with other people stimulates us. Just like lights, just like plants go towards the light, they're stimulated by their, their light and, and they start growing and processing, you know, uh, carbon dioxide into oxygen. So do we, in many ways, enjoy life because of the relationships 
that we have. So that's what relationships do to us. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> these are several advantages we talked about. Let's talk about disadvantages. <clears throat> what are some of the disadvantages? Well, uh, close relationships put pressure on you. They reveal uh, who you are and they expose your vulnerabilities. This is why a lot of people do not want to have close relationships. They want to have relationships, but not close relationships. Why? Because in close relationship, th things come out. The more I know you, the more I know about you, the more I will make judgments about who you really are. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? <clears throat> Some people are not comfortable with revealing that about themselves. They don't want anyone to know their weaknesses. Now, a true friend is not going to use weaknesses against another friend, right? Uh, a good, healthy relationship is not going to exploit those things. But there are a lot of relationships that are unhealthy. And they will exploit any type of weakness that they find. <clears throat> so some people are not willing to be vulnerable. They don't want to be in a position where somebody can use something they know about them against them. Okay? Embarrass them somehow. Or, you know, put them in a disadvantage. So... There are certainly disadvantages to relationships, and you can see this disadvantage to a close relationship. That's why people like to sometimes have relationships that are more distant, not as close. They will opt for a relationship that's less real, let's put it that way, uh, a superficial relationship. That way they still they have a relationship, but they, but they don't risk anything. There's no risk. So, also, close relationships increase uh, your obligations to other people, sometimes uh, to a great extent. So, the closer your relationship, the more, the harder it is for you to interact with other people and be ambivalent. You can't say no to your friend. When your friend needs something, when your friend needs help, you can't just say, well, I don't care, do it on your own. I'm not helping you. It's hard to say no to friends. It's hard to say no to a person whom you expect to say yes to you when you need help, right? If you're doing something for somebody <clears throat> or they're doing it for you, then you feel that obligation later on. Then they ask you for help, you need to be there. So close relationships put obligations on you. And some people don't like obligations. Some people like to simply take, but never give. So a relationship is a give and take. Uh, dynamic and uh, not everyone is comfortable with that so close relationships also can lead you to uh, abandon other relationships what that means is that imagine you have a friend that you have become really really close with but that friend cannot stand one of your classmates and you were okay with that classmate for a long time and you were, you were fine you don't have a problem with them you're not super close but you're okay and sometimes they help you out, and sometimes you team up and do stuff together. But the new friend that you have become very close with cannot stand that other person. What's going to happen to that other person? You're not going to have a relationship with them. Why? Because your relationship with this new friend is more important. It's more intimate. It's closer. So you're saying, I have to choose. If I have to choose, I'm choosing this one. Why? Because the other one, I'm not that close with anyway. So... Sometimes uh, you have to abandon certain relationships in order to help others. You know, imagine boyfriend and girlfriend. You know, boyfriend and girlfriend start beginning serious and all of a sudden uh, they have to let go of other friendships of an opposite gender that might put that committed relationship into jeopardy. So you can't have, you know, a boy, uh, you know, a boy cannot have, you know, seven girls that he's very close with. He can have one he's close with and the other ones have to be not as close, right? In the same way with girls. You just can't keep that up because the closeness of that monogamous relationship a lot of times will dictate and say, no, you have to choose me over them. Yes, they can be your friends, but not as good as me. So there's that. So some relationships basically uh, cause you to abandon other relationships. That is a dynamic. The closer your relationships, the more emotionally difficult they are. 
People to whom we are attached in, uh, in relationship emotionally can affect us in a harder degree. When we are going through something hard uh, or difficult in life and our friend is there to help us, that's wonderful. If they don't understand us, we feel even worse. We feel even worse. When the closest person to us all of a sudden can't help us, will not help us, does not understand us, or think that we're, we're wrong, or think that we're not justified feeling the way we feel. So they create further emotional turmoil for us. And that's, that's always hard. Again, that's what happens in close relationships. That's why some people choose to not have close relationships. They want more distant relationships. Um, <clears throat> also, close relationships are very difficult to dissolve. Uh, because it's uncomfortable to say, I don't want to be your friend anymore. It's uncomfortable to say, I don't want to be you know, your boyfriend or your girlfriend anymore. It's uncomfortable to say, I don't want to be with you anymore. I don't like you anymore. It, we don't like conflict. Humans, generally speaking, most humans do not enjoy conflict, do not enjoy saying no, do not enjoy negative emotions. But when a relationship is unhealthy, when a relationship is not working, you have to say, I'm done. And that is uncomfortable. People hate breaking up. People sometimes stay in a bad relationship because they don't like breaking up. They just want to pretend that everything is working because they don't want to say to a person, you know what, I'm done with you. It's, it's painful, it's hurtful, it's emotionally uncomfortable, so they don't. Uh, and that's the idea. And then, of course, you know, your partner can, can break your heart. And that's the idea that, that people who are in close relationship to us can't hurt us. They can bring us emotional pain and discomfort because of how differently we see life, because of how differently we see priority, the argument that can happen, you know, that you don't have unity, but you want to have unity, you want to be in agreement, but you're not in agreement, and that can bring emotional distress and turmoil. And so every single one of us are in a variety of relationships that cause us to have, you know, emotional discomfort to one degree or another. It could be professional relationships, it could be personal relationships, uh, there could be all sorts of them. They could be friendships, they could be love relationships that cause us emotional trouble. And that overflows into every area of our life. It overflows in our school overflows in our work, it overflows into our other relationships with people. So somebody who's going through a terrible personal relationship and they're being hurt, they tend to be not to be a fun friend to be around because they're consumed with problems they're having. And so every time you meet with your friend, all they do is unload on you all the problems that they're having and issues. And that makes it very hard to have that relationship for a long time like that. Who wants to listen to that non-stop all day long every day all the time not really that's not really what friendship is friendship is a give-and-take relationship it's not one-sided where you know I hang out with you for coffee and for 45 minutes have a free therapy session you know where I unload all my problems and all my guilt and all my issues upon you so that's the idea now <clears throat> you could see these are some disadvantages um, there are Positives and their negatives of relationship. Nobody's uh, being under illusion that having relationships is all positive. It's life. There's always pluses and minuses pretty much in anything in life. And relationships, have, they're complicated. They're very difficult. We need them, but then with them come some downsides. And these are the downsides that we're talking about. Now, some people see those downsides and they say, I don't want to have a relationship. To them, the downsides outweigh the positives. But I'm going to tell you honestly, the positives in reality outweigh the downsides. Because if this is if people disassociate from other people, they will not be successful in life. Uh, in many areas, they will simply not succeed. Uh, and and besides that, the in communication, obviously, they're not going to be a great communicator. Being a great communicator means you must have relationships. In fact, you must have other many types of relationships and you must engage in those relationships in an active way if you're hoping to become a good communicator. Now, if you don't care, then you don't care. Then you'll never be a, a great communicator. And in fact, all of these relationships help us develop 
our communicative, skill, communicative skills. And if we approach that seriously, uh, we can improve our relationships through good communication. Okay? We can make them better. So you can see how it actually works both ways. Communication and relationships are interdependent on each other. If you're a terrible communicator, your relationship will suffer. If you're a good communicator, your relationships will succeed. They will be better and vice versa. If you don't have any relationships with people, you'll never learn how to be a good communicator because you'll never have a chance to practice those skills because you're sitting by yourself all the time in front of your computer screen or something like that, you know, watching YouTube. Like, that's not life, that's not relationships, that's illusion of relationships because you're already having a relationship with a bunch of moving lights and pictures, that's all. So it's, uh, it's kind of difficult. It's difficult to have relationships, but they're very advantageous to us as human beings and communication is intricately connected uh, to, um, to relationships. So that, that's our first objective. That's where we are. We were going to talk about these advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the next objective we have is to talk about the stages of interpersonal relationship. Every relationship goes through stages uh, of development. Um, and they're fairly predictable and they're fairly uniform with everyone. Now, you know, keep in mind, not everyone, not everyone's relationship begins the same way. Uh, but once they get going, the trajectory is very similar. Not everyone's relationship ends the same way because sometimes culture affects how things begin and how things end. There's cultural protocol of what we do and what we do not do. But for most people, this is the trajectory. This is how these relationships flow. And, and so these interpersonal stages of relationships um, all come with <coughs> communication and messages that occur at each stage. They're unique. Unique stages of relationship correlate to types of communication or to the types of messages that we send um, through to each other in what, as we engage each other in these stages. So here are the six stages of relationship. Uh, you can see there's you know four primary ones, and then there's uh, the other the other ones that go to the left and to the right are are actually a choice. You cannot have either one of them. So you can you can have uh, you can have five of these stages, but you can't have all six necessarily uh, because they kind of the 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 ones on the bottom, the ones to the left and to the right, really excluded each other. All right. So that chart is located in your books, by the way, you can uh, refer to it on your books and it's on page 144 uh, in your textbooks. It's a great chart, it's a nice little visual way to explain to you. Uh, we can, uh, one of the things that you might notice on this chart is the little tiny exit sign. You can see that we enter the relationship and we can exit the relationship. It's not something that we're stuck in. We don't have to follow this whole entire chart. We can enter a relationship and then quickly get out of it at any stage, at any stage. Now that we, whether we choose or not is a different story, but the fact that, that even at the very first preliminary stage, we can end it, we can exit. Or in the second stage, we could say, you know what, not working, not interested, and done. So, so I'm going to go to um, <clears throat> through these relationship stages. But keep in mind, this is, uh, again, based on American culture. It's based on the Western culture, where relationships are consensual, where relationships are not arranged, where relationships are based on a person's will and desire. Uh, there are some places around the world where relationships are not uh, consensual, where people told, you will be friends, you will get married. You know, uh, they're arranged. You know, and so sometimes that happens, you know, uh, and that's okay, that's normal, it's just a different type of culture. So, uh, this book is just built around the idea of Western culture where relationships are completely voluntarily and are self-initiated, where there's this level of individuality brings, uh, brings us to this type of voluntary relationships.
So the first stage, that, that first bubble that you saw, uh, is the initial stage. It's what we call the contact stage. This is where we have some sort of a perceptual contact with the textbook talks about. Uh, you see, you hear, perhaps you smell the person. You know, you walk into a room and you see a person and you're attracted to that person for whatever reason. Maybe they have a really cool haircut, okay? Maybe they have attractive clothes. Maybe their perfume smells really good, okay? I don't know. Maybe they have a, a basket of fries that you're hoping they will share. I don't know what attracts you to a person, but at some point you meet somebody and something interests you. Something grabs your attention. Why are you attracted to that person versus, you know, 75 other people who are around you? I don't know. Nobody knows, really. But the fact is that seeing a person, uh, recognizing something interesting, something attractive about them, uh, hearing them talk, or, you know, having some sort of interaction with them is what uh, essentially creates this first contact stage. And as I noted before, whenever you see a person, you can choose not to enter a relationship with them. Let's say you saw somebody, you're attracted to them, you say, oh, that person looks nice. You can choose not to act on that. You could say, you know what? Maybe next time. <laughs> I'm too busy. I'm too tired. I, I, I don't look good. I, I don't have makeup on or something. You know, girls do this all the time. They run into somebody and they're like, no, no, I can't talk to them right now. I'm not looking my best. I don't have makeup on. I really want to have control over this and I really want this guy impressed. So I'm not going to approach them now. I'm going to pretend I'm not even here right now so they don't see me. So there, we control each stage of this relationship. So in the contact stage, we can choose to engage or not engage. If we choose to engage, then we go to the second stage, okay? That's called involvement, involvement. Now, involvement stage is where both parties have some sort of a sense. Uh, they want to be connected. They want to interact with each other. They develop uh, interaction. It's consensual, you, you can experiment with each other, you can try to learn more about the other person, you strike up a conversation, okay? Maybe more, you know, remember we talked about small talk, right? So imagine you're walking down the stairs and you're grabbing a coffee or a soda in a soda machine and you see another person and you may, you know, you may engage in small talk, something like, oh, you like Mountain Dew, me too, or something like that, and that's small talk, that doesn't mean anything. That's just you chatting up a person. You're not saying anything meaningful, anything important at all, right? That's small talk. But once you're past the small talk, all right, and you're starting to develop an interest in a person, you're starting to develop a relationship, this is where you really engage them. That's really where, when you become involved. And you do that by asking questions. You do that by experimenting with things. Uh, you're basically seeing is there something that can develop in this relationship that's beyond small talk? You know, this person seems nice. Are they really nice? You know, you're trying to kind of try it out in a very simple, easy, non-threatening kind of non-invasive way. You're saying, I want to give this a try, right? That's, that's what you're doing. That's what the second stage, uh, the, the involvement stage is. Uh, you're intensifying your relationship essentially, uh, but, but not quite, you know, to a degree of having a full blown relationship. You're just testing things out with that person. Will it work? Will it not work? I don't know. I haven't decided yet. Trying to decide basically if you want to be friends, if you want to have a deeper relationship. Okay. So that's your second stage, the involvement stage, the so contact and involvement. What is the third stage? Well, the third stage is uh, called intimacy. Uh, intimacy is the stage where you basically commit yourself uh, to have a deeper relationship with that person. Um, 
you can develop a relationship in this stage where you can become best friends, closest friends, you can become a lover, a companion. This could be now a long-term relationship that lasts years. This could be a deeply emotional relationship where you start sharing everything. Uh, people can start living together, sharing meals, sharing fun time, all sorts of things. Now you are really joined together with this person. You have constant interaction. You have frequent contact. You share things with each other and you hear and you value them. And so there's a lot of back and forth. You're past the whole testing, testing stage. You say, you know what? I am enjoying being around this person. This person is worthwhile having a relationship with. I'm gonna develop this relationship now, see where it takes us. Will we become great friends, good friends, long-term friends, short-term friends, or is this something that's not gonna work, but we never know. So at each stage, you know, if we continue, we tested things out, we say we'd like to give it a try, now we go into the next level, into this, uh, you know, intimacy uh, stage, again, we can end it. We could say, you know what, it's not working. I'm getting out, I'm, I'm gonna minimize, you know. I used to spend my every day hanging out with you, but you know what, there's somebody else I met that I like better. I'm gonna start hanging out with them more, and I'm gonna hang out with you less. And before you know, we'll hang out once or twice a month. And we'll just have a relationship, but it'll be more distant relationship. We're still friends, but I'm not gonna be as close to you. Because I found somebody else uh, that we work better together and we can have a closer relationship and what I'm looking for in a relationship essentially is uh, is working better with them. So that's an aspect of, uh, of our uh, intimacy stage. So you can see that this is a much more serious uh, moment. So something that happens here is our interpersonal commitment and social bonding. This is where other people around us realize that we have a friendship, we have a connection, other people acknowledge it. Uh, we're, we're, not pa we're way past that stage of testing each other out. We're, we're actually having a relationship and other people know about it. Uh, this is where we have make a personal commitment and then a social commitment or social awareness. There's this idea that, uh, you know, it, this is a known fact. We're, we're no longer just casual acquaintances testing each other out. We move, move into that serious, sort of say, aspect of relationship. So you get the idea. This is the most serious part of relationship. This is where people get married. This is where people become friends for life. This is it, okay? And it can end. And sometimes it ends very quickly and abruptly, and other times it ends very slowly. And there's a formal way of ending it, and sometimes it goes through the, another stage uh, that uh, may lead to an end or may lead to a non-end. And this stage is a very normal for most relationships that exist. Uh, whenever there's any type of an intimacy or a deep relationship, we call this deterioration stage. I know that sounds depressive because deterioration means for things to break apart, to fall apart, right? That's what that word means, deterioration. And in some way, it is true. In some way, it doesn't have to be true, okay? So the de deterioration stage is characterized by weakening of the bonds between friends or lovers, okay? This happens, this is normal. People have been friends for a while, and all of a sudden, their friendship goes cold. They're not as interested. That person who was really fun is not as much fun anymore, for whatever reasons. There could be a lot of reasons. Uh, and all of a sudden there's this cooling off, all right? There's dissatisfaction is what we call it. interpersonal dis dissatisfaction. Interpersonal dissatisfaction uh, is when we basically are no longer, uh, you know, enjoy this interaction with each other. We're, we're not happy doing things together anymore. We're not getting as much out of it, okay? Uh, and, and then that usually leads to what we call interpersonal deterioration. That's where now we have a problem with another person. Because we're not interested 
in an interaction because our interaction is lessened because we're not getting as much out of this interaction in friendship. We it leads us further into um, a relationship that starts to fall apart because well we don't really want to be with that person anymore. Like why would we want to invest and spend time into a relationship that's really we feel are not giving us as much uh, as we should be getting. So it's very subjective, and this is kind of different, you know, it works differently with different people, uh, and I'm sure it works even more so differently across uh, different cultures. But this deterioration stage does not necessarily mean, you know, the end. In fact, what if I tell you that most people who are married or in a committed relationship have certain degree of deterioration in their relationship all the time, okay? Nobody that engages each other in a deep intimacy relationship stays unchanged throughout their entire life, okay? People experience relationship challenges. So there's some change, the deterioration is a change in a relationship. But it doesn't mean that that change is bad or that means that change is uh, cannot be overcome, let's put it that way. And so, as a result, the next stage that happens in a relationship uh, is often called a repair stage. So whenever something deteriorates, think of it like doing maintenance to your car. Okay, if your car starts to break down, you don't just kick it to the curb and say, forget you, I'm done with you, you're going to the trash pile. No, you fix it, right? You could take it to the mechanic and you say, I need this, I need new brakes, I need new tires, whatever. My car needs an oil change, it's not running the same way, can you fix it? Something is broken. We do the same in relationships, right? When we have a relationship that is experiencing some squeaks, some deterioration, you know, we can't, we, or something is not healthy, something's breaking down, we can repair it. So this stage, um, some partners may pause during this deterioration stage and try to fix it. We don't necessarily say, okay, I'm done. Things are not working the same they used to. If you ever buy something new, and you, let's say you buy a new laptop, right? Within six months to a year, it doesn't run like new anymore. You know, so, you know, like, unless you have unlimited money, you don't just throw it out. You're like, oh, let me take some files, let me delete that, some stuff, let me clean it out, update my software. You try to fix things, right? You try to make it work better. Same thing with relationships. Things do change. Um, it's inevitable, but we choose to, we can choose to repair uh, during the stage. And again, we will go through inter, interpersonal repair and interpersonal repair. These are just two aspects of how we will approach our problems depending on the type of the problem. So in a relationship, a person may say, hey, how come you, know, you don't want to spend time with me? What's wrong? You know, even somebody like married couples, you, know, you see married people, they get married, everything is great, then five years later, they're, they're drifting off. They used to go out and do stuff together, and now they don't. Well, what happened? Now the woman goes with her girlfriends, and they hang, and hang out and go shopping, and the, the guy sits down with his guys and they do stuff. They don't do stuff together. What happened? And they're saying, what broke down between us in our interpersonal relationship? You know, where, how can we fix it? Well, I'm not interested in this. I'm not interested in that. You know, and so people find common areas where they can repair their relationship. Okay? Sometimes if we keep drifting up or apart like that, we'll drift apart to the degree that we can't repair it. But if you catch that problem early on, and you fix it, you repair it, then you can stay in that relationship for many more years. But if you choose to ignore that, usually your relationship will fall apart. And the same thing is an interpersonal uh, aspect. You can, you can work things out uh, between each other, and you can work things out for yourself, you know, inside yourself as well. Uh, accepting another person, accepting uh, their, their change, accepting, accepting, accepting things that are different with them today. Let's say people get married uh, and they look a certain way and then one of them 
you know, get sick, and they can't do stuff anymore that they used to do. Well, you could choose to say, oh, all right, I'm done with you. I used to, I, we used to go out jogging every day, and now you can't go jogging with me, so forget you, I'm done. I need a jogging partner, and you're no good to me. Done, you know. Yeah. Or you could say, you know what? You're sick, you're not healthy, let's work with it. Let's work together, let me build you up so we can go jog again, like we used to. You could choose to work with that person or not. So again, it, it's really all up to us. Uh, we can engage this relationship of re uh, repair, or we can choose not to, we can exit at this stage. And the formal way of exiting uh, is the sixth stage, is called the dissolution stage. Uh, this is where the last stage of relationship, where you basically say, all right, I'm done. We're breaking up, breaking this apart. And I'm letting you know formally, I'm letting you know, you know, openly that this is not working. I'm not interested anymore. Let's go our separate ways. But instead of just going our separate ways, in, in the Western culture, people acknowledge going separate ways. They don't just stop seeing each other, okay? Like, you know, imagine that you have a relationship with the, between each other and all of a sudden you just stop communicating. I call you, you don't call me back. I text you, you don't text me back. That's not, then, then I don't know what's going on. I'm thinking something happened, uh, some kind of trouble. I may come to your house, try to look, for, look, look to help you because I think you may be in trouble, right? Because I don't know. No, if you don't want to have a relationship with me, you can't just avoid me. You just have to say, you know what? I don't want to have a relationship with you. Stop calling me. Stop texting me. Stop emailing me. Stop, you know, reaching out to me. If you don't let the person know, they then don't know. So this is what this formal stage of dissolution really uh, uh, exists for. It exists for people to let the other party know that we're done. This is over. We're moving into a new stage, a relationship which means we're not in a relationship anymore. That's the new stage. I am me and you are you and we're not interacting. So that formal stage is very helpful um, you know, to happen, although it is very uncomfortable. And many people do not want to go through this stage. They don't want to go through the repair stage. They don't want to go through the dissolution stage. In fact, a lot of people are stuck okay, in this deterioration stage forever. They don't want to go and fix it and they don't want to end it. So they're stuck in a very unhealthy, sometimes emotionally damaging relationship. Whether it be friendship, whether that be work relationship, you know, with like a boss and employee or other co-worker, you know, whether it be love relationship, marriage, doesn't really matter. All relationships go through these types of stages and we, a lot of times, are stuck. And the places we become stuck is the deterioration stage. Yes, a question about the intrapersonal between the intrapersonal and interpersonal, what is different? The difference. The difference is excellent question. Thank you for highlighting this. So anytime you guys want clarification, just just do that. So here's how I can explain it to you. Intrapersonal. Look at how it's spelled. Intrapersonal. So this is between persons. So it's be, we have two people, and this is between you and that other person. So each person is seeking to analyze, okay, what is wrong. You're saying, what is wrong with this relationship? And then you're looking for answers. And I am saying, what is wrong with this relationship? And I'm looking for answers, okay? So each one of us are independently working to figure out what's wrong. Okay, so that's intrapersonal, that between two different persons, essentially, okay? Now, interpersonal relationship is where you work on it together. I am trying to figure out what's wrong. You are trying to figure out what's wrong as individuals. Now we come together and trying to figure out what's wrong. You see, you have to figure out what wrong you are doing in your own understanding, okay? And that's separate from me. You have to do that on your, on your own. Okay, then I have to do the same thing on my side. Then we come together, and this is interpersonal relationship. Interpersonal means we're actually interacting. 
Now it's not up to you and it's not up to me. Now it's up to both of us. Now that we have worked up to that stage, what are we going to do together to change this? Which steps I will take, which steps you will take, which steps we both agree we will both take to fix this? Most people have to do that in order to create a repair stage. If they don't do that, there will be no repair. Most people idea of repair, you're wrong, you need to fix it. You are crazy, you need to become normal. <laughs> you know, I'm okay, there's nothing wrong with me. It's all your problem. You fix it, you change, you become different. You're lazy, you become better, you become not lazy. I'm okay, see, but this is the problem. That's what we call, that's an interpersonal fixing, right? But it's one-sided. I am only recognizing your problems, I'm actually not recognizing any of my part in your problems. It's all about you, it's one-sided. That's why there had to be first an intrapersonal idea of saying what's wrong. So a lot of times if you come to a counselor or something like that, a lot of times married couples, they're looking, they're looking for advice, they're looking to fix their relationship, a counselor would work with them independently and they would ask them, what do you see as wrong? And then they would ask the other person, what do you see as wrong? And then they're going to say, what do you think is wrong with you? They're not going to ask you, what do you think you see is wrong with your partner? Because obviously most people can answer that question, right? They're going to say, what do you think you are doing wrong? And then they compare the lists. And they say, look, your partner says you're doing this wrong, and, and your partner says you're doing that wrong. Do you see that? No, I don't. Well, there's a problem. This is, this is why you can't connect. Because you're doing something and you're not even realizing that you're doing it wrong. Now that you know you're doing it wrong, now that you know it's driving the other person crazy, are you willing to change? Right? And that person says either yes or no. Depending on their answer, that relationship will either work or doesn't work. Does that help you? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for asking me that question. Sometimes I assume uh, that you guys get this and... You know, don't ever be shy to ask me these questions. All right, any other questions? We're good, all right. So, so these are the six stages of relationship, but remember, it really, we're really talking about five stages. And the sixth stage can go either way. You know, it just, you know, we got these four, you know, four stages, and then that conflict stage where there's deterioration. Deterioration just means going through life, okay? I deteriorate. I get up in the morning and my back hurts. Why? Because I'm not 15 anymore. So that's the idea. There's normal deterioration and the same thing's going to happen in relationships. There's going to be some things that need to be fixed and repaired. So we're always in that stage in the relationship and deterioration. Which way is it going to go? Are we going to work it out, fix it, or we're not going to fix it? And that's going to eventually lead to a dissolution stage. So that's that's that left-right side of the chart that we've been looking at, okay? So those are the natural stages. You can see how stages like this do not just apply to a, a marriage relationship or just a love relationship. These apply to any relationship. This could be applying to a workspace relationship, by the way, too. Now, a lot of times at work, you're stuck with people and you can't really help it because you work together in, in the same area, so you might have to avoid them. You might have to, you know, you might be forced to fix that relationship. You don't have a choice to dissolve it, let's put it that way. You can't just say, I'm not going to work with you because you're working the same shift you're working in, and what can you do? So you can try to fix it or you can choose to live with it in the stage in whichever it is. It may not be very functional, uh, but, so, but these stages overall apply to all sorts and all types of relationships, so hopefully that makes sense. Is that helpful to you guys? All right. Again, this is not rocket science. We're living this. It's just looking at it in a very scientific, organized way allows us to think it through, okay? It allows us to pause and say, all right, I know exactly what's happening with me right now. This is where I am. I am in this stage of relationship with this person. 
what am I going to do? I have these options. I have this option and that option. Now, you remember, all of this applies to your communication because each stage of a relationship, your communication changes. All right? In that very first stage when we have contact, all it is is going to be small talk. You're not going to say anything meaningful to a person. You're just chatting it up. How was weather? Did you see that game? Did you, you know, did you go to such and such movie? You're just talking stuff that's general, that's not controversial. Just, just making, starting a conversation, starting a relationship. Then as you get to know each other a little better, you know, you start asking more probing, more personal questions. And this is where some people check out. They say, you know what? I don't really want to have a relationship with you. Stop asking me questions that are personal. I don't want to know. No, you can't have my phone number. <laughs> that kind of stuff. You see what I mean? This is where it either goes, continues on, or it doesn't. And, and so each level, each stage of the communication, you know, a stage of relationship correlates to a, to a type of communication. And communication just gets deeper and more intimate as we move into an intimacy level. Very complicated, very emotional now. And, and the further we go, sort of say, the more involved we are. And so you can see how being a good communicator can help you to be successful in a relationship. And you can see how being a bad communicator will actually hurt your relationship. People will exit relationships with you if you don't communicate with them. Inability to engage in a small talk, okay, will make sure that you will not have the second stage, that involvement, is not going to happen. I mean, imagine, imagine you and I are buying a soda in the machine, you know, together, and you know, and I start small talk with you. You're like, "Hey, you bought Mountain Dew. I like Mountain Dew too." And you look at me like, and you're like, and you don't answer anything. Where is that relationship going to go? Nowhere. I'm going to look at you and say, "That person is not answering to me. Either they're deaf, okay, or something's wrong with me," <laughs> you know. Uh, they don't speak my language, whatever. I'm going to think like a dozen different things while they're not answering. And then I'm going to say, okay, whatever, I'll walk away. And that relationship now never happens, right? Why? Because you failed at small talk. You and I did not connect. We didn't move on to the next stage. That's it, we're done, you know. So if you're not effective, you end up hurting yourself in developing the relationships. So you're not going to be able, if you're not a good communicator, you simply will not develop relationships. And as you don't develop relationships, what's going to cause? It's going to cause all of those advantages of relationships that we talked about not to exist in your life. No, you won't have any disadvantages, but you won't have any advantages either. 